reincarnated. Just a few points before we begin. There will be no flash photography during the press conference, but as the talent enters the room, photos may be taken from your seats once the press conference begins. Only the six accredited photo agencies can take photographs during the press conference. TIFF will make the photos uh, from the press conference available on the media site within 24 hours in case you want them, and our volunteers with microphones will be moving around the room to handle questions. When you ask your question, please remember to identify yourself and your media outlet. Everyone make sure your cell phones are turned off, and just remember this press conference is streamed live at www.tiff.net. Our moderator for this session is George Strombolopoulos, and it is, now, it is now my pleasure to welcome the director, producers, and stars of Reincarnated, or star of Reincarnated, Snoop, of course. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Please welcome the wolf, the lion. Hi. All right, so we'll just start uh, this way. Um, Snoop, it's one thing to go through a personal journey. It's something completely different to make your personal journey public, to tell people about it and to show it. What was it like to watch that story being documented? Um, it was different than any other thing that I've ever done before because everything that I've done, you know, naturally I've done it because I wanted to do it. This was something that was, you know, called upon as far as the spirit called upon me to do this record and do this movie. So to sit back and watch it and see it all come to life is special because it's everything that I wanted. Saroosh, how did Vice get in on this? Um, well, Ted Chung, Snoop's manager, uh, approached, approached me at the end of last year. And we started talking um, about different projects that they were doing with Snoop. They were going down to Brazil and they talked about this Jamaica trip. And um, <clears throat> you know, he, he explained that Snoop wanted to go and do something that he hadn't done before, make, um, you know, go off site and make an album and go into a different creative space and, and make a reggae album. Mm -hmm. and, and Ted extended the invitation to us to, to accompany them on this journey. Um, so that's how the conversation started. And we went down and, um, you know, not really sure what to expect at all. Ted, was the transformation, you know, the idea of being reincarnated, Snoop said a lot of really pointed things off the top about the next stage of his life. Did that happen before the decision to make a reggae album? Or did the trip precipitate a lot of this? Um, I think the, the trip really inspired um, you know, that transformation organically. But um, certainly, you know, it's kind of a culmination of all the incredible events in Snoop's career leading up to that point. So uh, Jamaica was definitely like a turning point and, and a place of inspiration for that. So Andy, y you have this moment where you're like, okay, now we're going to document. So th you don't want to make a music film because this isn't really a music film, even though music plays a big part of it. So how, how do you set about to make tell the story? Oh. This one, telling the story. The story we wanted to tell was of, um, I think people had got to a point where they were forgetting what Snoop had been through as an artist and as a person. And we wanted them to remind them of that stuff. And we wanted to show them so I guess there was some cynicism of the move to move do this, and we wanted to show how uncynical and natural it actually was, and mm -hmm. the reasons behind the move. Uh, this is obviously being uh, streamed live. We also have questions that came in from Twitter, and uh, I'll get to one of them before we get to your questions. Somebody actually tweeted in Snoop and wanted to know where the name Lion came from, Snoop Lion, and, and, and also what does it mean to you to be Snoop Lion? Um, they just crowned me the Lion, you know, because it's associated with Rastafari, it's associated with reggae music, and they felt like the dog was no, li no longer needed, you know, for my journey that I was on. Mm -hmm. So it was given to me. It wasn't that I chose that name. Was, that in, name in the was film, it was Bunny me. Whaler. Bunny Whaler called you lion. I mean, that's what they all call me, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's a natural transformation. It's like from the dog to the lion, you understand me? It's not anything but a, a, a transformation and a growth of an artist and a person and a man. Mm -hmm. We've got questions out here. Go ahead, man. Microphone's coming this way. Of course, man. Hi, uh, Bruce Kirkland, a uh, Toronto Sun. A uh, question for Snoop Lion. Um, I'm curious how you get past the issue of cynicism around a transformation of this nature. That because that's something that uh, I think it was Andy who mentioned in passing that uh, you know there might be that aura around it. 
do you just ignore that and just be yourself? Or do you have to address issues of people being suspicious no, that this may not be a true transformation? I don't believe that you have to address it as long as your actions show that it's real. You know, people know me since day one. I've always been upfront and personal and I've always been me. I've never faked a funk. I've always gave it to them uncut and raw. So this is just another page to my book. So please enjoy. <laughs> we got a question. We got one here, Rudy in the back. But go ahead. Um, thank you very much. I love the film, and thank I you. really Linda Carter from G ninety eight point seven. Hello, Linda. And you had two of my heroes in there, Louis Farrakhan. Yes, ma'am. If you were on the path with Farrakhan, so many years ago, I believe that you're in the that what's, what brought you to Rasta. I believe so too. I believe that. You know, by me associating with Minister Farrakhan, you know, 11, 12 years ago, trying to find peace, trying to put, you know, some harmony in the music industry, and it never really got, you know, the attention. It never really got talked about, but we didn't care because we knew that underground, we were doing our job and doing our service as far as keeping the hip-hop community alive and doing something positive. And now that you see me doing reggae music and becoming close to Rastafari, it's only a natural transformation for me coming from that to this. But you went to the true heart. You oh, went yeah. to the true heart of Jamaica, the true Rastafari. The Nyabingi Temple, they, the Nyabingi Center, beautiful. they took care of me. They, they laced me with the information and the, and the guidance and the nurturing that I needed, that, that my mind and my body was so you know, desperate for, you know, because I've always been a peaceful, caring individual. I've always been one in the hip hop community who's been looked at as the peacemaker. Whenever there's a beef or a misunderstanding, they call me to end it all but I never really knew what the reason was. Now that I understand what my calling is, now I can truly do what I need to do. How much, has your relationship with leadership changed? And, and your, has it changed with that word to you? Is it, does it mean something different to you now? Um, no, nah, because um, anything about a leader, anything that you know about a leader, he knows he's a leader from day one. So it's just more you know, to the table, more to add on, more people to lead, more information that I will receive in order to give to people who want to know this information. It's all about getting to the right part of your life where you know who you are and where you want to be. It's about living healthy, being happy, and showing love, and that's all I'm about. When did that start for you? When did you think you needed that? I believe it was always a part of my life, but I was just double-dutching, like jumping in and out, you know, halfway in, halfway out, and still living the young, childish, you know, gangster life, because that's what I was brought up to love and to know. But once I, you know, sought out information on my own and found out what a true man was and what true love was all about, that's when I, you know, became who I am today. Go ahead. Right, Rudy's got the mic back there. Snow Blind, Rudy Blair, 680 News. Uh, two questions. One, uh, when did it actually happen for you that you realized that this was the path you wanted to lead? If you can talk a little bit about that. And two, with this film, are you hoping that people will understand what you have gone through because you do have some people who don't believe that this is for real. Well, when it, when it all happened for me was um, <clears throat> the day that I accepted myself and said that I wanted to go to Jamaica and to do a, a record and to film it and, a, and to document it. And my whole thing was I was always, you know, saying to myself that I was Bob Marley reincarnated. So I wanted to just figure out how could I get into the minds, bodies, and souls of the people of Jamaica and not just go and steal their culture and take their music and run off with it, but go be a part of what they're going through and understand the struggle because at the same time, people from different parts of the world go through the same things no matter where they're from. And what I found out and what you'll find out from watching this movie is that the Whalers were similar to 213, that we grew up the same way, struggling, trying to make music and trying to find a way. And once we made it, we gave back and we looked and found ways to to help out other people and to inspire people. And for those who feel like it's not real or it's not authentic, that's, that is what it is. You're going to have your own opinions and your views of it. I'm just trying to do me. I can't do you. I can't make you like what I like. I can't make you get down the way I get down. But what I can do is put a clean glass of water and a dirty glass of water in front of you, and you can have the choice to drink whatever one you like. Ted, when an artist that you have says, I'm Bob Marley reincarnated, and now we're going to Jamaica, how do you feel about that? Well, I think what, you know, Snoop is specifically referring to is that, you know, as hip hop artists do, there have been lyrical references um, where, you know, Snoop had mentioned that in rhyme form. Yeah. And so that wasn't necessarily like the, um, 
like a, a an inspiration to go to Jamaica and try to make all these things happen. I think the intention was to go to Jamaica, you know, be influenced by the culture and the people, and um, try some new things. And then you know, Snoopadelic Films being such a important initiative for Snoop right now with the long form content we're creating and partnering with an incredible company like Vice, um, we thought we would just capture some of that. But um, the actual spiritual element and the connection with Rastafari was something that just naturally happened out there. You can't plan for that, right? I mean, we didn't know who we were going to meet or what we were gonna be doing or that we would have the chance to go to the Nyabingi Rastafari Temple. Mm -hmm. So that was just um, Ja, higher power, you know, bringing all of us together to the right places in Jamaica to make that happen. Cool. Uh, we, Karen, did you get the mic there? It's me, okay. Hi, uh, Karen Bliss from RollingStone.com. Um, just like a fan of the Rolling Stones might go back and discover Robert Johnson or a fan of Bob Dylan might look into Woody Guthrie, are you hoping that your fans will also go back and discover Bob Marley and Tosh and other artists? And my second question is, you, you say in the film that you'd like to spend more time with your family and less with your dream and your job. And have you reversed that since the filming? I'll answer the second question first. Yes, I have reversed that. Uh, I made my family more a part of my business as far as my everyday life and not putting them second like I was as far as following my dream. And I believe that my dream is my family because who wouldn't want a family over a dream of being a star? So I chose family first. And back to the other question, <clears throat> yeah, definitely I want the people who listen to my music to go back and pay homage and get the understanding of reggae music and where it came from and what it was started on and what it was built on and know that I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not what reggae music is. I'm just a piece of it. I'm an extension of where it's going to go because I believe it was made as a seed to grow, to go across the whole world for people to enjoy it and love it and make it a part of their lives. And that's what I'm doing. It reached me all the way in Long Beach, California, and I'm bringing it back around to the world again so people can love and respect reggae music because it feels good when you're listening to make it reggae music and when you're making reggae music. Where are this, sir? Thank you. Uh, hi, Sean Condon from MSN Canada. Uh, you talk at one point in the film about how you and Nate grew into men, being men together, but also you talk about your mother, the tough love, and the, the absence of a father figure growing up. Is Rastafari sort of the piece that is bringing that out within you now for yourself? Um, I believe it's, it's showing me the righteous way to be a family man because I've, I've never been taught that. You know, I was raised by my mother, and she did a great job, but I never really understood a mother, a father, in, in a household, so I believe that this lifestyle that I'm choosing right now, this liberty, is definitely shaping me and molding me into a better husband, a better father, a better person, so most definitely I agree. This is for both Sarush and, and Andy. What was the biggest challenge in putting this film together when you were there? Jamaican drivers. <laughs> <laughs> like... The truck that tried to kill us that night. <laughs> we had to drive, do a lot of driving into the jungle, late night sort of stuff with very rainy stuff going on. With <laughs> a lot of that. That guy's trying to kill us. Yeah. The esoteric ways of the Jamaican security team I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> and how they clashed with the American security team was something that I enjoyed a lot. Yeah. As, an app, as, like an, as a sort of bystander. <laughs> but I don't know if a serious answer. <laughs> that was one of the most challenging things. Uh, I mean, you know, George, you're familiar with the type of content we've been doing, and this was definitely a different project for us. Um, He's been in, in uh, Pakistani gun markets, uh, in, 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 and Shane from Vice has been in North Korea and places, and, and you guys clearly push the boundaries. So, Well, you know, and, and when we film in these conflict zones, the idea is blend in and, and go with a small crew. Yeah. But when you're rolling with <laughs> a lion, you know, it's, it's, there's, you have to take a lot of security precautions. Yeah. And like Andy said, there's Jamaican security. We have American security. And you end up, and then you hook up with Damien Marley, and he's got his scene. Next thing you know, you've got 16 SUVs cruising, cruising awesome through Kingston. Yeah. And that's not like a blending in kind no, of sure. way to shoot. <laughs> so, so there were like lots of challenges like that. But it was also, you know, how uh, can we get the good stuff and this isn't just kind of going to end up being um, 
you know, Snoop in Jamaica, like a puff piece. Right. And, 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 you know, Snoop was gracious enough to open up and let us into his world and take us on that journey. So it was a new kind of shoot for us, but, you know, it was one of the most amazing <coughs> projects we've worked on. You're the so first much. one that said puff, though. I mean, the amount of weed in this film is out of control. <laughs> it's, it's incredible. This is that film. It was the amount of gnawing away at Ted and Uncle Snoop that they let me do without being slapped. Please yeah. let me do this. Can I do that? Let's do that. Let's do this. Let's do this. And I didn't get slapped once. Nah, but you, you were good to work with. I want to let y'all know. I call him Lil Head. That's his nickname. But <laughs> Lil Head is, is, is he's, he's the kind of guy that wants you to jump on the back of a motorbike and ride down a, a cliff and hold on for dear life and get a great shot. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you know, he pushed it to the limit, and that's what I was looking for. I was looking for people who were willing to go with me to Trenchtown, to Tiffley Gardens, to go through the neighborhoods where people aren't permitted to go through with a camera and really get some real insight on what these people in Jamaica are going through, what their struggle is. And like I said, I didn't want to just come to the city and take without giving. So on another note, we're building a program called Mind Gardens where we're building and showing the people in Jamaica how to you know, plant fruits and vegetables and grow their own produce and they'll be able to reproduce and make money and sell it at the same time. So we coming back and giving back to these same communities that we went to where we seen where there's a lot of struggle and people say, well, they're lazy. They're not lazy. They're just not given an opportunity. So we're going to give them an opportunity to get it, and that's what we're doing. Right. Hey, if you want to get a question, it helps if you get the microphone as well. Go ahead. I got it. Hi. Nadia from South Africa. Snoop, I wanted to find out, you, how do you deal with now the requests for you to play your old music, you know, your old tracks that people know you for and love you for? You played Doggy Style the night before the announcement came out about Snoop Lion and your, your change. So how do you deal with that? Well, one thing about me as a performer... I understand the business and you know a lot of my fans gonna want Snoop Dogg and I'm gonna give it to them and it is what it is and then some of them will adjust to the Snoop line and it is you know it's the the being able to be versatile I'm able to do that I can give you a little bit of both or I can give you one or the other it depends on what the people want and whatever the people want I can give it to them uncut up close and personal hey, yeah, Snoop. Oh. hi Snoop this is for you uh, Rayanne Farah from Fast Company Co-Create um, there was a comment made earlier about um, discovering uh, the historical reggae through this change for you. Um, but there's a point in the film where there's a, a, an acknowledgement of the fact that reggae culture is incredibly commercialized um, and it's almost become a bit of a cliche, you know, go to college, put on a patch kind of thing. How do you hope that, and you're also a very commercial star, how do you uh, hope this, this balance between commercialism and what you're really experiencing through this um, transition to Rasta will will be kind of played out, I suppose. Well, what we're hoping on doing is getting um, some sort of television program with the Nye Bingy Center and letting them teach you Rastafari the righteous way, the real way, from the people who know it and understand it so it won't be no gimmick. And that way you get the full understanding from the people who live it, who lived it, and who understand it. And to me, that's the thing that I would like to do is give it from the people who understand it, as opposed to myself who's just learning it. I could never teach it. I could only learn along the way, and I'm going to make a lot of mistakes, and I don't mind making mistakes, but I'd rather be taught from the people who know about it more than I do. So we, we're looking forward to creating a television program that's going to give that understanding so it won't be so commercialized and so, you know, connected with trying to get money out of it or when you throw red, yellow, and green on, we're getting paid off of it. That's not what we're in it for. We're in it for the spirit. Any question back there, sir? It was Stoop. Uh, first of all, respect for uh, bringing uh, us this great music and for uh, always challenging us through your music. And uh, my name is Victor Baines Marshall, Radio Region. I got two questions. First of all, how uh, did you hook up with Diplo? Uh, what, what was that process about, uh, Major Laser? And uh, the other question would be, um, how has have you gotten any feedback from your other rappers in, in, in the, you know throughout the, uh, North America? primarily, and what, what, have, what, do they, what do they think of your, uh, your, uh, your journey? I'm gonna answer the second question first. Um, all of the rappers in the hip hop community respect me because I've always given them respect. No matter if I was the biggest star in the world or the smallest star, I always looked at them eye to eye. I've always been able to give people respect and love and information and guidance, and that has always held me down. So 20 years later, you know, I'm looked at as Uncle Snoop. So they respect everything that I do. So when I decided to make this transformation into reggae music, a lot of my rap brothers 
come from Jamaica and are from the reggae world, so they really root me on, and they, you know, they really wanted to do it. I really are so happy that I'm able to bring a new light to our world of music, to where people don't have to feel like we just one-sided and we're one-dimensional. So it's all love and all praises for my people. Now, the first question that you asked, what was that again? Oh, how did I hook up with Diplo? Well, we loved Diplo from working with him in the past, and we loved all of the music that he did, all the international music, and then we was looking at the reggae scene, and we was seeing that he was really, you know, going in, getting the old artists from the reggae world, mixing them with the new, and just keeping the spirit alive, and he was really like, he had his pulse on the reggae scene in Jamaica. So that's what we wanted, and, and to me, not to even be like a gimmick, but he was like, what Chris Blackwell was to Bob Marley for me. You know, and it just, it felt like that. And when I had a chance to, to have a conversation with Chris Blackwell and Diplo and myself together, it felt like that vibe and that circle was rekindled, you know, to, to give us the blessing that we were doing the right thing and that we were on the right path as far as making this music stand out first and foremost. Because the whole project was about the music, reggae music getting the attention that it deserves because I'm tired of it not being classified as one of the great genres of music because many people have made lots of babies off of reggae music and made lots of, you know, great things happen off of reggae music. So we need to, you know, treat reggae music like rock music, like rap music, like any other genre of music that's been here for over 50 years. You, you've been rapping for a long time, so you have a confidence when you get on the mic. And, you know, it's routine in a sense. Making a reggae record, did you, did you have the same confidence? Because you know that... you you're doing a completely different thing. Yeah, because the confidence is within, you know, within yourself. I've always had reggae music associated with the music that I was making. If you listen to any early Snoop Dogg, there was always reggae influences like Black Blam, Blam to them fall, listen to the sounds from my nigga Doggy Dog, but Papa, Dr. Dre, him boss gunshots, diggity dads, then RBX, them boss gunshots, come again. You know, just a little shit like yeah. that that yeah. I was doing. That you know, that I was known for, but I never really was, you know, fully locked and loaded into reggae. And once I was able to get locked and loaded into it and get people to write for me and to really give me what I was missing. See, this project was about me bringing in the best producers and the, be and the best writers. It wasn't about me writing from my spirit or me, you know, telling you my story. It was about bringing in the best writers who could bring to life what I wanted to express, which was an album about love, peace, and struggle. I've never had an album that I could put out that represented love, peace, and struggle. I always had to, you know, maintain my Snoop Dogg aura or, you know, the things that came with the gang banging or the shit that I was so accustomed to as a kid. But as I become a man, I learned to get rid of my childish ways and to do things that feel good to me. And this reggae project feels good to me. You had a question? Or if the mic? Hi, Kaleem Aftab from the London Independent. Um, Snoop, in the film, I count you wearing five different soccer jerseys. Do you collect <laughs> soccer jerseys, and what made you choose those teams? Yeah, because I hope you don't ask me which team I like. I don't know which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but um, over the years of going to Europe, I, I became a big, a big soccer fan, playing FIFA, you know, playing the video game FIFA. And every, you know, country that I go to, I get close to the, you know, to the soccer players because I'm a fan of the sport. I don't have a particular team that I like. I love the, the sport. So I can, you know, juggle from jersey to jersey, player to player, because I love the sport. And I haven't locked into a team yet. So you'll see me, you know, wearing a lot of different, you know, jerseys to represent different players because I love the sport. Another Twitter question here is, what's something you tried for the first time while you were in Jamaica? What's something I tried for the first time in Jamaica? Oh, some, uh, some, some real coffee uh, that was made from coffee beans that they picked off the tree, and they made it for me right there on the spot. And the I don't drink coffee. How about the sip? The rasta sip? The soup? Oh, the, oh yeah, that? I tried yeah. the Ital soup. Yeah. I tried that too, Ital soup. It was all vegetables and made with natural you know, herbs and spices. It was awesome. Go ahead, right there. Hi, Snoop. Christine from uh, Reuters. Can you talk a little bit more about the name change? Can you compare the image of the lion to the dog? <laughs> and uh, why have you kept Snoop in your name? And secondly, uh, will you keep playing your old hits? Uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm always going to continue to do my music, you know what I'm saying? And as far as the name thing, it wasn't me making the name change, it's the name that I was given. 
So, you know, when you're giving something, you like to, you know, honor it and, you you know, hold it up with pride. I'm still Snoop Dogg. This is me right now. I'm Snoop motherfucking dog till I die. But at the end of the day, when I'm making my reggae music, I'm in the light of Snoop Lion. So, you know, you have to respect both worlds because there's a softer, more gentler, peaceful side when he's the lion. But if you disrespect me or get out of pocket, you will get the motherfucking dog. Back there, we have a question. You bitch, you. <laughs> yeah, hello. I'm Susanna with German National Public Radio. You mentioned earlier it was all about love. Um, however, there's been some criticism from Jamaica, too, um, by Sizzler, who said that um, you know there was an ex aspect of exploitation, maybe, of the Rasta culture. Um, what's your response to that, and have you talked to Sizzler? I don't, I don't have no response to that, because I come in love, so I can't, I can't answer, you know, hate with love, but all I can do is say, my, my mission and my journey was, was genuine from my heart. The people that I connected with, we had a great time. We, we, we built a brotherhood and a fellowship. And you know, the people that I didn't connect with, you know, it's like that sometimes. When you go to a community and you don't touch everybody's hands, you know, some people are gonna feel left out. And they're gonna feel like, you know, it, it, did, it wasn't real because it didn't come through me. Well, one thing about Rastafari, it's not about the people, it's about the spirit. So not one man or one person can say whether you right or you wrong. It's within the way you live, your way of life, your liberty. So I want to say peace and love to Sizzler, and hopefully he'll get a chance to meet me so we can sit down and chop it up man to man. Andy, you want to get in it, Ted? He, he, I think, I'm Sizzler, sorry, yeah. yeah. Add, adding to that out. spirit, yeah. you know, and updating from that is that there's been a YouTube video recently where I think because of the spirit that Snoop Lyon's been carrying, he actually expressed his support for uh, the change and, and um, his spreading of the, of the vibes of Rastafari. So you should check that out on YouTube. Cool. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, hey, Snoop uh, and George and everybody else. Sarush, Ted, Andy. It's uh, Dalton Higgins from CBC Music. This nigga sound like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what were you going to say there, Snoop? What? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> After the press conference. Um, so the question I had for Snoop is, uh, you know, like most music genres, um, reggae, I'm, I'm actually of J Jamaican descent. So when I heard you say, like, I tell, you know, like, that's what I grew up with, I tell cuisine, you know? And um, what I want to ask you is, did you feel a need to take on the Jamaican uh, nation language, as we call it, or you know, speak patois uh, while you're recording or while there? Because it's a, the language is part of the music, you know? Yeah. yeah, most definitely. But I felt like some of it, you know, through the direction of the producers and the writers, some of it was necessary for me to put the patois on it, and then some of it was necessary for me just to do it naturally, the way, the way I do it. But at the same time, when you listen to it, it's a natural blend to where you hear it in there, you know what I'm saying? Like even the first song that I put out, La La La, if you listen to that, you can hear a little bit of the, them I walk, them I talk about this a one, them I laugh and go on about that a one. Hey, what you want, you can't get it, get it, and the problem will get real dready, dready. Sing. You feel what I'm saying? So I can do that, but I'm going to do me at the same time. <laughs> what did the, it's in the film, but I mean, if you can build on it, the passing of Nate Dogg and, and the impact that had on you as it relates to this journey. Mm. That's the part of the movie that I don't ever watch because I'm still touched by it, I'm still hurt by it. And when you lose somebody that close, it's, it's never a reality, you know what I'm saying? You can never really, like sometimes I may sit in my apartment and I look at a picture on the wall and he looking at me and it's like we right there with each other. I don't, I don't think of him as being gone, but when I see this particular part of the movie, it really touches an emotion in me that, you know, I, I rarely get to get into as far as being able to cry and, to, and just to get real weak. So this is one part of the movie that I really don't like watching. You know what I'm saying? I expressed that to them, but you know, I left it in there because it was, it was necessary. But as far as me, I, even if we was to watch it together, I would have to walk out because I can't take that, that, that part of the movie because it's something about our friendship that I don't ever want to let go. Mm -hmm. You got a question here? Uh, hi, Snoop. Uh, this is Chad Dunleavy from the Montreal Gazette. Um, we see it in the movie, like your, your transformation. I mean, that we kind of watch your, your month in Jamaica, but maybe you can tell me, tell us in your own words, what the month was like, what you went through, and how you see that time, how it, how it changed you. Um, 
Well, the whole month was 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 a roller coaster, emotional roller coaster. You know, I believe Whitney Houston passed while we were out there as well, and that that was heartbreaking as well. Uh, my little cousin Daz lost his nephew while he was out there. It was just it was a lot of emotions that we was going through. One of our uh, guys that was shooting with us lost his grandmother. It was just it was a lot that we were dealing with as far as the whole crew emotionally, but we were standing strong and, you know, just it's just something about Jamaica this time just it just really held me down. Usually when I go to Jamaica, I go to my hotel room, get me something to smoke on, do my show and leave. But this time I was really trying to be about the community. I really wanted to see and touch the people and I really wanted to get in depth and, and get some understanding on why, you know, the Jamaican culture was so close to my heart, why they love me so much and why I love them so much. And come to find out, find out we brothers and we sisters and we all the same. So it was just a, a family reunion. And to me, that was the biggest part of it all, that we came out of their family and we can look at this project 30 years from now, the people that made it. And I believe it blessed everybody on the project, not just me. I think it helped everybody out because everybody was going through some things and they just not in front of the camera like me to say it. They not just you know, gonna say that they were able to be touched and to be, you know, lifted from the negative spirit in their life. I feel like it blessed everybody that was with us. At one point at Coachella, you, your back was to the audience and you turned to the crowd and said, Ja Rastafari. Was that a tease for what was coming? Were you just opening the door? That wasn't a tease, that was a spirit. You know, when the spirit is in you, you know, you, you gotta come out. You know what I'm saying? That's my way to release, you know what I'm saying? When I say, Ja Rastafari. You know, it's, it's an emotion. And the crowd, you know, some of them are overwhelmed that I'm even that, that I'm even that on that page. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that are there with me, you could just see them jump out of their skin like, yes, he's home. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a feeling, it's not, it's not an act, it's an expression. And it, and it comes, it's like, it only comes every once in a while. You can't even plan it, it's just gonna come when it's ready to come. Mm -hmm. Karen, you had a question? Yeah, one uh, quick question and something else I wanted you to elaborate on. Um, last year I actually saw a film that Donisha, um, Bob Marley's granddaughter, made and she was discovering uh, the roots of rust and she left Jamaica and went around the world, including actually to Toronto. And I'm wondering if you've seen that film or if you're aware of it because it's got so much history about it. Um, and my second question is, because I have this silly job as a music journalist, I started a website that's sort of my anti-tabloid called SamaritanMag.com, and I'd like you to elaborate a bit more on what you said earlier about giving back to the people. You mentioned something about them yeah, growing Yeah, Mind their Gardens. Own. We have a program called Mind Gardens. Ted, elaborate on them and let them know what's going down with Mind Gardens so she can know what's happening and spread the word real quick like. So Mind Gardens is a, um, is a nonprofit initiative that Snoop Lyon started with uh, John Paul DeJoria, who um, runs Patron and uh, John Paul Mitchell hair care products, um, who's very involved in community give back initiatives. So uh, he and Snoop partnered up to basically create self-sustainable gardens starting in Kingston um, and util utilizing the tenants of the Nyabingi Rastafari diet and Ital diet um, with the specific fruits and vegetables to give back to the young kids in the community. Um, so we want to make sure that, that, you know, and Snoop is very obviously involved in the community, even at home with his Snoop Youth Football League, uh, which is a huge initiative of ours. And um, it's just kind of like how he's always been. Everywhere we go that, you know, we're a part of that community, we want to make sure we give back as well as, you know, entertain and create content so um, Mind Gardens is that program for what this journey is with Reincarnated. Andy, is there extra footage that didn't make it into the film that you can see having another life elsewhere? Yeah, there's tons of it. We've got uh, like a lot of more work to do. We, to we have 130 hours Jesus. of footage that we shot. We shot like two, <laughs> 250, yeah. something crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Why do you need more content? I haven't Why seen that more? movie. I need you to get it for me. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, We've Snoop got the whole Las Vegas visit, which is like a movie yeah. in itself. And then from from Jamaica to Vegas. We went, went to Ali's birthday party. Oh yeah, we didn't, we didn't put that in there, huh? I went to Muhammad Ali's 70th birthday party while we were uh, in the process of filming. This was the only time that I left. I didn't even want to leave Jamaica while I was out there, but I got a call from the champ, the greatest of all time, 
-hmm. And uh, the champ said, uh, I need you at my 70th birthday party. So I had to stop what I was doing in Jamaica to go, you know, bless the champ. And I performed for him, and he was enjoying himself. And I sat with him and took pictures with him. And that's like my childhood, you know, I wanted to be Muhammad Ali. And for him to call me for his 70th birthday and for me to perform for him and his daughters and his family, I mean, that was the biggest treat in, in the world for me. And, and it happened around the time I was doing this project. So that let me know that the project was a definite blessing and I was headed in the right direction. I also got a chance to talk with Quincy Jones in the back. Uh, that's when I met John DeJour. I mean, I, mean, I mean, it was a beautiful situation where everything fell right in place to where it is right now. So I'm thankful for that night. Happy birthday, champ. Why, why, did, you, why did you guys choose Vice? Why Vice? Yeah. Because Vice is on the edge and Vice is, they connected to everybody as far as like multicultural and they hip and they know what it is and they are connected to what I need to be connected to and who I'm connected to. They are my audience, they are my, they are my people, they are who I am and they are the only ones who really could have went on this journey with me because they knew how to push me to the limit and they knew how to get what I needed as far as having the right team. They had, they had a female that was working with us and she was, she used to get on my nerves in the beginning, but she got it, <laughs> no, on the real though, but she was like, she was the bomb. Like she went and got us all the hookup with all of the places we needed to go, all the people we needed to meet. And she was, she was like hard, like a dude, like, you know what I'm saying? Like. <laughs> I got to get this done. Like, That's but Kadeen, you, but our co-producer. She's, <laughs> she's in the back You got to be like that when you're working with me, though, as far as like being a woman. You know what I'm saying? And it's just because I get down like that. I want everybody to go hard. And she went real hard. She went very hard. And to me, she was like a very big help to this thing getting done. And, and if they wouldn't have put the right people in place, even picking Andy and picking, you know, all Nick and all the people that they had that made this project easy and fun for me because I'm not the easiest guy to work with when you got a camera in my face every day. Any questions? Yes, sir, go ahead. With the mic right, yeah, right there. Yeah, um, just uh, Mike Hogan from Huffington Post. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the controversy about the B word and whether that's something that comes to you, especially with this uh, transformation in your life. Well, I didn't use it on this new album, but uh, I still use it in my everyday life. There's a lot of bitches and bitch ass motherfuckers in the world, so I don't think I'm gonna ever stop using the word. So, you know, forgive me for keeping it 100, you know, and don't let the word fool you. <laughs> it shouldn't be the word, you know what I'm saying? It's the people that you're projecting the word to. You understand me? If you can dig that. But there's a part of the film where you talk about wanting to be positive. Like, that's a big part of it. And I know that when the Beastie Boys had their many transformations, a major one in the late 80s, there were some things that they didn't want to say from their old music. Is there, I know you want to play your hits, but are there words and things that you don't want to do anymore? Well, it's not that I don't want to do it anymore. I just didn't want to do it on this particular record, and I don't want to do it when I'm making reggae music because I feel like it's, it was never intended for reggae music. Those words were hip-hop words. Those were the hip-hop language. That was the, the language that hip-hop communicates with. But reggae music can you know, articulate with different language, with, with a different style of language, a language of love, a, a language of struggle and peace at the same time. So to me, I wanted to exercise a record that I didn't have to use those words. I didn't cuss one time on this album. And it's like, the, they, it was, they was edging me and pushing me like, you should rap on this song, you should rap on this song. I'm like, no, I don't want to. I want to keep the spirit of what we doing. And as I listen to all of these songs, as they come back with the mixes on them, they sound exceptional. Go ahead, sir. Okay, we'll go in there and then we'll come up here. Presidential election? Uh, they need to give Obama four more years, man. I mean, Bush fucked up for eight years. So you got to at least give him eight years. To, you know, I mean, he clinked half the shit up in four years, realistically. It ain't like y'all gave him a clean house. Y'all gave him a house with a... TV didn't work, the toilet was stuffed up. <laughs> you know, everything was wrong with the house. So he had to come and, you know, get y'all thing together. And then he went and knocked down <clears throat> our most hated and most wanted, the one who had our terror on orange or red, whatever color it was on. He went and found him, the one that Bush couldn't seem to find, that seemed to fly away the day of the 911. Remember all that? 
He went and found him and knocked him down. So don't forget about that. Now everybody is peaceful and able to move and, you know, go to have a good time. It's because he made that happen. So please don't forget that. You understand me? So give him four years to get his thing together and finish this deal out. You heard what Clinton said. You love Clinton, didn't you? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, hello again. Linda Carter from G98.7. Mind Gardens, will you be doing anything like that in the States? And do you think that reggae music will help to quell some of the anger, particularly with the young people, the hip-hop um, generation that's happening in the States right now? Do you think that that could cross over to them also? I believe that uh, my influence alone can do that. And I like to put a lot of pressure on myself because a lot of people follow me. And I believe that the best example I can be is by doing the right thing. And when I do the right thing, it makes others want to do the right thing. And that's one thing about hip hop. We're very influential. We influence the nation of people to follow. We have so many different genres and you know ethnicities who, who love hip hop that is never quoted as a black thing anymore. It's your thing now, it's everybody's thing. So we're that influential. So if we do the right thing with one person at a time, it will reflect and it will pass on. Cool. Any more questions from the audience? Well, thank you very much, guys. One last Twitter question. We've covered a lot of it about the journey, but somebody from Twitter asked, what was your best part of the journey? What was the thing that mattered the most to you? Realistically, was that my wife was able to come and see it happen because that's, to me, is like the change was most necessary for her more than anything because I've always been there for my kids. I've always been a good dad, but I ain't been a great husband. So I wanted to try to, you know, reverse that and for her to be there with me to see that I was willing to make the change and the change just happened like right before her eyes, like just to see that even if it wasn't going to happen, the point was that the effort was there. Mm -hmm. And that takes a relationship a long way when you see somebody making an effort to want to do the right thing to keep it together. So that was the most important part to me is that my wife was there in the beginning of this whole process. Andy, Ted, Snoop, Sarush, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>